Mela Basil, Gavin Tider, Deputy Editor, and welcome to Journey to a Digital Government. This morning, we'll be discussing how to unlock new ideas about data management and its potential for digital services. We have a fantastic group of digital leaders and innovators from the US and Singapore public sector, and it's great to be working with Cloudera to share their expertise. Let me introduce our speakers today. We have Poonam Sons, who's Chief Data Officer at the State of New Jersey. We have Cheng Jini, who's joining us on audio. He's Head of CapDev and Data Engineering at the Ops Capabilities Data Science and AI Center of Expertise at HTX. We have Professor Thomas Liu, Group Chief Data and Strategy Officer at the National Healthcare Group. Vincent Loy is Assistant Managing Director at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And we have Andy Choi, Director of Sales at Cloudera. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll be using the Three Horizons model to guide our discussion today. It's used by future thinkers to understand the potential of different possibilities and how to get to the outcomes we want. These questions will allow us to really unlock a better future and strategically unpack some of the issues faced in government. Let's first start with what is broken now? And Professor Thomas Lee, if I could just start with you. What are some of the issues you're observing and how data has been used to power healthcare services? Oh, okay. Uh, wow. Uh, I, well, I, I think to, to understand the role of data in healthcare, we probably need to sort of get to the bottom of what perhaps is wrong with healthcare today. I think uh, we have much to be uh, grateful in Singapore for the excellent infrastructure, the system, the facilities, and the responsiveness of the uh, workforce. Uh, but at the same time, I think we are dealing primarily with, uh, with health care at a stage where the problem is already with our patients. Uh, patients are already sick and in need of treatment. And that is a very costly undertaking, especially in a population that's getting older. Uh, and for that to be sustainable, we have to move upstream. And to move upstream, we have to go into prevention. We have to go into the treatment of uh, chronic illness before they deteriorate. And we have to do this at a cost that is sustainable uh, in keeping with the country's uh, affordability. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, Data has a big role to play. Uh, whether we are using data today to achieve the goals that uh, I've just mentioned, as opposed to the present day, uh, what is urgent, what is crisis, what is currently uh, being used, I think that is the paradigm shift that has to happen if data is to enable us to jump that gap between how, what we're doing well today and what we need to do well tomorrow. Fantastic, thank you. And Vincent, if I could just go to you to talk about what is happening at the central bank and uh, what are some of the issues we're facing and how data is being used in that sphere of work. Okay, thank you. Um, let me, um, financial services is a very um, strange uh, uh, industry. Uh, unlike healthcare, actually, the data actually has a lot of meaning in terms of helping the, the people on the ground and the use cases are much more pert pertinent and much more personal. And I suspect in financial services, we are on the other extreme, which is that we do a lot of probably a bit of boasting, a lot of imagination in terms of what data can do, and probably we oversold it in terms of what data can do. Okay, and, and so sometimes as a regulator and also as a person responsible ultimately for the strategy of data in the financial services sector, I do worry about that because there are fundamental problems that we need to sort out in terms of data. No doubt that data will have a very, very important role in financial services, but we need to get some of the fundamental right. One of them is in regards to um, the use case, clarity of the use case in the financial services. What problem are we going to solve? Secondly, is in regards to, there is also a big problem in terms of data scientists with data engineering. And that is about the people, the skill set, and how to skill a lot of things from POC to production. And that has always been a challenge in financial services in terms of data. And last but not least is the fundamental of data in terms of data governance, data 
uh, taxonomy and uh, uh, also uh, ethic uh, uh, data as well in terms of how to make sure that data are used in a proper way and what are the governance that around the data. So these are the three components I see in financial services. Over, thank you. So we really need to get some of the fundamentals right in um, financial services. And Poonam, um, just want to uh, hear about your experience at the state of New Jersey as well. Um, what are some of the issues that you're observing and how the government is using data? So what we're observing here is that we have data. We have so much data, we don't know what to do with it. So the problem we're finding is how to um, really make the data more meaningful, how to present it in a meaningful manner, how to figure out what data sets are of most value to the citizens. Because I work for the state of New Jersey, so we're a public servant for the public of New Jersey. And that is the number one problem, like not just where the data is, but how do we format it in such a way that it is most useful for the public. And of course, I agree with the other speakers where they said data governance is key. We have already set up a data governance you know, standards for New Jersey, metadata standards, et cetera. So we don't publish any data unless we have the asset level as well as the column level metadata already given to us. But um, other than that, of course, staffing is always key because if you don't have good staff, that could always also affect how the data is being presented, how it's being honed in and uh, published for the public. Fantastic, let's understand what data is meaningful and valuable and also having the right skills and talent within your team to make the most um, of that. And if I could go to Jingyi uh, to talk about sort of the, the home affairs and public safety um, perspective on this. Yeah, sure. I mean, in, in the recent few years, I mean, there's explosion of data and then that's like exponential growth in data usage as well. So um, from our angle, it's really important that, you know, well, um, you know, uh, we ensure that there's uh, scalability in terms of infrastructure to take in all this data. Um, there is also a need to actually protect all this data. Data security, we need to heighten in terms of data security as well. So it's always, a, a, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like a two-way thing. Um, I think in one way, it's you need to protect your data. In the other way, it's uh, you need to ensure that you know, our data scientists or even the data engineers coming in uh, have the right access to all this information. So th there needs to be a balance involved as well. So with that, um, that's when um, we are able to um, you know, utilize the, the right tools, having the right tools and the data involved to actually ensure that you know, we, we do keep Singapore safe and secure in this space as well. Fantastic. And Andy, what are some of the common problems you're observing in how uh, data is managed in government? Uh, I can see that the panel uh, actually voice uh, uh, the points that are very uh, commonly observed uh, that we see with our large uh, uh, government uh, customers. Um, so in, in terms of uh, where we see, uh, we, we can see that uh, there are uh, two main issues. Uh, one is onboarding data at scale. Uh, because of the variety, velocity, and, uh, uh, um, and the volume of the data coming in, um, things have grown uh, exponentially. Uh, so the way to be able to uh, discover, categorize, and classify data uh, become a challenge, uh, especially uh, in quite a lot of data today are uh, in uh, uh, streaming data, uh, real-time uh, type-based data that require very fast response uh, to enable an organization to really make full use of the real-time meaning of the data uh, at very um, uh, quick uh, uh, response. Um, so that, that, that becomes uh, a balance uh, for an organization to, to bring the data in and um, sort them out um, fast enough to allow a uh, user to use. Uh, so if, if you, uh, like, like some, of, some of the points that uh, uh, the panel has brought up, uh, if you do not sort it up properly with the governance and security, you may create a different set of uh, problem when, when you have uh, data ready for user to use, but uh, it's not sorted out uh, properly in terms of governance and uh, security. Uh, but in, and the, the reverse, uh, like what, uh, um, 
our speaker uh, Son has said, uh, if you push it out too soon, um, then uh, you lose the governance and security. Uh, then that may be an issue. Or you, or you put it uh, too much process in itself, then the data didn't make it to the user to be used in a quick manner. So that's one point. Uh, the second point is very much related to the first point, that how do we make this uh, large volume of data um, to be accessible to uh, users everywhere. So users from everywhere and users to everywhere. So data is in a cloud, in cloud operator A, B, C, and data is in on-prem. And how is this making its way uh, to the user and make it transparent to the user? So these are the two uh, things, challenge that we see. Fantastic, thank you. And we, we've talked about a few issues that have been tying together. We talked about scalability, speed, and governance. And we talked about cloud at the moment, and Singapore government is really pushing for a move to uh, use more public cloud um, services. We wanted to get a perspective, uh, perhaps first from Vincent, on what are some of the challenges in how um, cloud services are being used, particularly around managing data? Okay, um, 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 the way we look at cloud in MES is that I think that cloud has a big future in, in, in the future of uh, technology and also financial services. In fact, personally from financial services sector, I feel the financial services sector has not embraced cloud as much as we can and we could. We should do more of it. But having said that, there are inherent uh, problems in terms of cloud. There are risks in regards to cloud. And one of them is concentration. The other one is security. Thirdly is that when you use cloud, you embed a lot of capability inside the cloud. And if you don't manage it properly, you lose your capability and over-reliance on the vendor. Uh, these are, this are problems that need to be sorted out. Um, I, I really applaud the government in terms of encouraging all the government uh, uh, sector to go into cloud. But one of the caution I just want to make is that uh, uh, it is important if you really want to use cloud, you have to make sure the application are ready to use cloud, to embrace cloud. It is not a shift, uh, move and shift effort because when you move and shift without changing the application to make it cloud native, you are basically increasing the operation risk without increasing the ca uh, capability within the organization. And uh, what, what we do in MAS is that uh, before we move to cloud, uh, we actually uh, uh, re-architect a lot of our application or infrastructure to make it such that they are cloud native and such that when they go to cloud, they can uh, assess all the capabilities and all the wonderful things that we can do in clouds and actually help the organization to, to, to really progress further. Uh, and this has to be done in a very thoughtful, uh, 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 risk uh, um risk aware manner because moving to cloud that is um, I also think that actually one of the big problem in terms of cloud is that the uh, there is a misalignment in terms of capability and I think that most of the capability in cloud are still with the vendor the cloud provider and there is not enough cloud people in the industry other than the cloud vendor and actually uh, to go to cloud you really need to manage it well and which means that you need have to have the internal capability and that is something that I think that we, we as a country still need to build. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Vincent. And what's your perspective on this, Thomas? Um, what kind of challenges has healthcare faced uh, in using cloud services? Uh, thanks, uh, Meta. I, I think uh, for health, uh, security is very important. And secondly, the ownership of data has become increasingly a, a question about whether this is a personal data of a patient or is this data that we are free to use and analyze for the patient's good. And, and I think that uh, that dichotomy between what uh, what is my data and how can I protect it, how can I uh, define its portability and uh, restrict its portability versus how can the system better use that data I think determines where this data is hosted. I think for healthcare data, it's still very much a data sovereignty issue of making sure it is within the country. Secondly, uh, we have not uh, moved beyond a very strict classification of, of sensitive 
of health data as being sensitive and therefore uh, presiding in, in the private cloud rather than in the public cloud, even though that might be as secure as it could possibly be. Uh, this sort of creates uh, differences in the way we approach the needs of our population. Our population's needs are not primarily health, they are health and social. And increasingly, there are many social determinants of good health care. And so as we kind of try to merge what the, the patient needs to feel secure about him or herself, her, their future, their financial uh, uh, stability, as well as the, the ability to assess different types of social services to enhance their well-being, uh, health data needs to increasingly uh, move between the internet and the intranet space. And I think that is where uh, the present crux of our effort are being directed at to ensure that this movement of data is safe, it is secure, and to the extent that if it is potentially identifiable, then it needs to be really, really safe so that there isn't any potential for leak uh, out of the system. Yeah. Absolutely. And let's look at the second uh, bit of today's conversation. What's the hopeful future? And Jingyi, if I could just go to you first for this. Um, how do you think that data management, particularly better data management, how can it unlock new opportunities um, in public safety and home affairs? So what's the hopeful future? So it's something whereby we every stage it to, to help benefit the public in future as well. Uh, we have wide arrays of data that is required uh, to actually ensure that um, we, we do keep some for safe and secure. So um, what's hopeful right now is that, you know, I, I really see it, uh, it, it in a way that, you know, maybe 10 years ago, there weren't so many data scientists or data engineers out there who, who is actually looking into data. And in the, in the recent few years, there was a large boom in terms of like, there's a high demand in terms of people engaging um, their scientists to actually analyze all this data information. So that's when I really see that, um, especially digitalization is actually going at a much, uh, in a, a much faster pace than before. So that's when I see that, um, and especially like during this COVID-19 period, whereby a lot of digitalization um, is going on board. So the hopeful future is that I, I do really see that more data will be streaming in and that um, in this space, there will be a more demand in terms of data and that we still need to grow faster in terms of in, in this space and environment. Uh, that's when I, I, I do agree that um, we need to be technologically abreast as well so that um, we have the right infrastructure, we have the right people with the right skill sets to actually bring, to you know, really analyze the information so that we can actually bring a lot of value add to the public as well. And then keeping, keeping the entire Singapore realm to be really safe and really secure. Yep, mm -hmm. that is how I see it. Thank you, Jing. So that, that's a vision for the future where we have more data, we're able to handle that data better and analyze it better for uh, public safety. Uh, Ponem, uh, Ponem, what's your view on this? Um, how could we build a predictive and anticipate to government using data in the future? So I wanted to touch on the cloud area because what we did was we maintained the governor's transparency site because in New Jersey, we believe in transparency. We want to show the public where their tax dollars are going. So back in 2010, when we had the Open Data Initiative, where they said, please set up the site. We had an in-house, you know, we built it on Apex, Oracle Apex platform. We had about 10 programmers that were maintaining that site. And in 2014, we moved it over to the cloud. So we're using a platform as a service, a cloud, open data cloud platform. And it's been very successful. So now I only have two people that are maintaining that same site because we moved it all onto the cloud. It's a COTS product and it's very, very robust. So while as in the past, we had just like a static spreadsheet you could see on the screen or on the, in the app, with the cloud, we have so many more uh, you know, strengths of the cloud. 
And so now our entire data set, all the data sets are on the cloud for the governor's transparency. We had a super storm and we maintain that data as well on the cloud. And our most recent project was for COVID-19 because our governor, you know, he put out a mandate in July saying within three months, we want a transparency site for all the money that's come in from the federal government and where it's being sent out, you know, given to awarded. And so we set it up within 90 days. And again, I do not think we could have done it if we did not use the cloud. Now to, um, I guess, Vincent's point was that for security, what we're doing is we're only putting operable data out there, which is Open Public Records Act data. So it's not data that has anyone's date of birth or social security number, no PII information at all. So that's how we're able to do it because yes, even though it's FedRAMP compliant, we're using AWS, Amazon Web Services. It's um, medium FedRAMP compliant. We're still a little nervous about the security of data. So we really don't want to put social security numbers, data births, et cetera, out there. But anything that's operable, we are putting it out there and we are having great success with that. So that is really good. And to get back to your point on um, your question was how, where are we going with it, I guess? My question was around what is your vision for the future? Are you looking at things like that? Okay. So for the future, I feel everything is going to be on the cloud is what I predict. Because just based in the last five years that we've been working with the cloud, it's very, very successful. And once we're convinced, maybe we can go to high uh, FedRAMP compliance, uh, clouds, and then maybe we will start putting it on the cloud, even the PII data. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, Andy, I just want to get your perspective on what should a strong strategy for data and cloud management and government uh, look like in the future? So I think um, uh, once the cloud uh, issue, uh, you know, the security governance um, and the regulatory and uh, compliance is set up. Um, that, that will be a, a good place uh, to realize uh, the value of data um, in a very quick manner. Um, so when as, so, as soon as data is born, uh, the use case can be created. I think that that will benefit many, many people. Um, so that also means uh, the ease of uh, uh, data onboarding um, can be done very quickly, um, you know, because uh, the, the infrastructure is now an elastic infrastructure. Um, but the, the, the end benefit uh, for a government agency, I think, is the ability not just uh, for an agency to be able to uh, make use of the data, but to collaborate with other agency um, that, that form um, uh, the, the value that, that that's operating for the benefit of the public. Um, so this collaboration, using the data, sharing data, um, still within the security and governance uh, uh, that, that runs the, the data, uh, mm -hmm. but it will definitely benefit uh, with this collaboration for multi-agency coming together and say, you know, when I share my data, how does it benefit the other agency and how does it benefit the public? So it's a vision for more collaboration and data sharing across different parts of the government. And yeah. uh, Vincent, what, what's your vision uh, for the future? Um, my, my vision for the future is that um, um, I, I look at it for MES and also financial services. We have to be the, 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 the fastest and probably the best adopter of new innovative technology but we also are, are cognizant of the threats that come with this thing, technology. So we will manage this threat uh, uh, very carefully and deliberately on a risk-based approach. And also at the same time is that um, the, uh, the whole ecosystem will have a very big role to play in financial services because the financial institution cannot innovate by themselves. The, they need the whole ecosystem. And that includes the private sector, the government sector, together with the uh, uh, financial institution to, mm -hmm. to make it a much more thriving, innovative, agile uh, uh, financial services sector. Thank you. And uh, Thomas, are we looking at in healthcare at the future that 
that has a lot more predictive services that can help prevent some of the challenges that you laid out earlier? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think Poonan uh, made a very good point that a lot of the what is available in the cloud today uh, can further the public health, right? Uh, there's many information that we see already in the Singapore uh, Ministry of Health website uh, that will lend transparency to what is the current status of our health system, the current COVID crisis, the cost of care, the differential cost of care, and to inform uh, individuals on their choices. At the same time, I think that uh, the public uh, cloud is, has also that ability to increasingly be a channel for very useful information and timely information that could, uh, in any crisis, in any health uh, uh, scare, uh, allow them to also react very quickly to credible, transparent information. Uh, and, and I think the second point about how we're moving is that for us to interact with patients, with healthy individuals, we, we must digitalize and we must move to a space where they are engaged right, uh, on a regular basis. And that cannot be the hospitals. It cannot be our physical systems. So it will become a very digital, very mobile environment in which we engage them. And at the same time, we will have to engage with other providers, uh, social agencies, the intermediate and long-term care sectors. Uh, and, and these will enable us to form this uh, collaborative relationships. So uh, that's uh, the movement of data, right? The movement of information. And uh, where they reside, I think we are still very conservative about where data should reside, but for the movement, I think we certainly need the public space to enable the future objectives. Yeah. Fantastic. And we're going to look at a third bit of the conversation today. Where is the evidence of the future and now? And what are some of those cutting edge case studies um, that already that what we're seeing around us point to what the future uh, could be. And uh, Thomas, Thomas, if I could just go back to you um, for this. And could you tell us a little bit about what kind of cutting edge work um, NHG has been doing this year, particularly in response to COVID-19? I'm sure there's a lot of innovation that has come up. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's, it's not really just us. I think the whole of the uh, healthcare system in Singapore has uh, responded, uh, I think, with great uh, adroit and, and, and speed right, to the scenario that has unfolded in front of us. I think on the one hand, we have been able to make use of our command and control systems in order to manage resources, to identify bottlenecks, as well as to be able to then move these, uh, the resources to where these uh, pain points are. At the same time, uh, we have been able to rapidly adopt uh, mobile technologies to scale from, from in the early days of uh, COVID, for example, a uh, few thousand patients to 50,000 patients to, to enable safe depository of uh, health information and for this information to be accessible to the appropriately uh, uh, authorities that that should be able to assess them safely. So I, I think in some ways, uh, these are evolutionary jolts, right? That has helped us understand the possibilities uh, that may not come in peacetime. But with regards to future models, I think uh, as we look for a model of the health of a population, rather than just the health of individuals when they fall sick, there are many successful models all over the world. And these models uh, address the ability to share data between various uh, providers and the ability to form relationships uh, based on team-based care, based on a social medical uh, construct of providers, as well as uh, patients' uh, accessibility to 24-7 information. So there are many small uh, communities all over the world uh, in Sweden, in Alaska, uh, in parts of the US that has successfully created not just a good health system, but a sustainable health system based on the value that they bring, outcome 
versus cost. And Singapore, fortunately, this is a small country that we can kind of size our strategy based on many of these communities. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Jingyi, if I could uh, hear from you about how HCX is using uh, data to guide the kind of services um, that you're providing um, across the, the home team agencies. So in terms of evidence of the, uh, of the future and now, um, I, I think one area that I just wanted to focus on is actually, I think in these days, there is a heightened data security measures put in place. And this is somewhat a, a precursor as in like in, growing in the coming future, how data would actually grow. So it also shows the demand for data would be on the rise. So what we are actually looking at, at right now is that, you know, how do you actually treat data in use? How do you treat data in motion? And how do you treat data at rest? So with that, uh, we are also looking into how we can enhance data protection and also prevent all those kind of data compromises, like um, you know, reducing all those kinds of surface areas of attack by minimizing you know, uh, unnecessary data collection, and then ensuring that the right person are looking at the right data. So these are the kind of things that we are looking at into right now, as well as um, we also have to look into things like, you know, how we can protect data directly and after which um, distribute it to um, the right person and then, and then ensuring that um, after this has been, uh, the project has been done, how can we actually, you know, uh, so-called destroy the data in the right manner. So at the same time, we are also looking into how we can raise competencies across all the um, data scientists across the board. Um, that's very important because with that, um, knowing that uh, they have the right skill sets, knowing that this is the direction that we are charting towards, um, that's when we can actually instill some kind of culture of excellence, you know, equipping them with the, the right kind of competency to perform their roles effectively. And also inculcating uh, the culture of excellence as well in terms of how they can use and share data securely uh, because after all uh, the nature of a business is that it's pretty much sensitive as well so so all this information um, and how you protect and how you uh, deal with data becomes really quintessential and then important i think lastly is is to ensure that the infrastructure that we are actually using is actually sustainable and resilient enough uh, so we are also looking at how we can deepen uh, each um, uh, uh, each individual's uh, expertise, uh, be it data scientists or data engineers, in terms of like, say, data privacy protection techni techniques or technologies out there, and then how we can actually um, build in certain measures within the infrastructures or it, within the data itself to actually ensure that, you know, um, to minimize all those data kind of form of data leak. So one thing is uh, probably we are also looking at is it, uh, whether there should be like so, some kind of like hashing methods involved when it comes to like protecting of individual data and all this. So that's an area that we are thinking of looking to. Like. So this is the evidence of the future in the now. And that's the, the area that we are also thinking of chatting to. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jimmy. And uh, Vincent, could you give us some examples of the kind of cutting edge uh, innovation that we're seeing within um, financial services sector? Maybe I share with you, uh, there are different facets to it. In terms of, um, in terms of technology, um, uh, we, we are familiar with FinTech, which is basically technology in the financial services sector. There are a lot of innovation out there. Some of the things we see are banking as a service, which means that you don't have to be a real bank. You actually can buy the sole service of the bank and actually use it like a bank. Mm -hmm. and, and you can do all the things that you can. It is basically coming in a box. And that comes to container, containerization of platforms as a service is going to be very big in the future. Uh, even within internally MAS, we are building platform as a service. Uh, and this are uh, different platform in terms of um, either be it data platform or be it collaboration platform or user interface platform. So there are different platforms that are built and this will allow us to be scalable and also be very fast to market as and when we need. And so we build modular system. These are the things that will happen. Mm -hmm. The other area that we probably need to think about is API. And I think that API will, be, will have a big role to play in future. This will allow information sharing, data sharing, and also help to have a thriving ecosystem between uh, ecosystem partner. And then that comes to data. 
uh, data will have a big role in financial services. Uh, alternative data will be used for a lot of more um, banking services, but in terms of understanding where are those uh, underserved customers, using it for credit analysis, and also in terms of uh, trying to find out unfulfilled demand within the whole uh, the society as well. Uh, we are seeing a lot of good things in terms of using alternative data. And, and this will, you will see more of it in, in the digital bank, which I can't disclose, although I'm involved in that. And, and so, and the, in terms of security, again, this is one area that I think that we will see a lot of transformation work. Uh, we have seen uh, reconstruct like in terms of, um, I think that um, 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 uh, isolation of web will be a norm going forward, I suspect, in some shape or form. And also in terms of reconstruction of the email when you receive it, such that uh, now whenever there's an email that is received, they will reconstruct by the system so that all the malware will be taken away and you still can see the email as it is, but without all the script underneath it. And there will be a lot more uh, 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 real-time monitoring and that's where behavioral analytics will come in and will have a big role. And that's where the fusion of data and cybersecurity will come together, together with technology as well. So those are the things that are going on in the industry. And I see the future is about data, it's about technology, and also it's about a fusion of all these things together. The line between data technology and uh, it's going to be very blur basically on all this. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Vincent. And Andy, what is Cloudera observing globally? What has a good data strategy enabled some of, for some of your uh, public sector customers? Well, um, well definitely the, this topic has been uh, discussed. Uh, so the hybrid cloud uh, adoption is uh, what we termed it, um, where data no longer resides in uh, a bare metal data center. Uh, it goes uh, across uh, many places, um, um, a private cloud uh, uh, within the bare metal data center, and also across into the public cloud, uh, maybe even across uh, different uh, cloud, uh, public cloud providers. So uh, to wrap it all up, we call it this hybrid cloud adoption um, that's happening right now. Um, speaking to customers, um, they have concerns about um, managing security governance um, and things like uh, replication policies when you push jobs and data into uh, from one location to another. Um, how do you manage um, uh, the security and governance, whether it follows the way the user access the data uh, when the jobs has been, then the data and the jobs have been moved to different locations. Um, and also uh, the part about learning curve because um, uh, tools might be different uh, uh, in a private cloud or bare metal environment compared to uh, in a uh, public cloud provider, uh, A provider P provider C. Uh, so this, this, this are, these are some of the things that we see is emerging um, and, and is, is moving at a very uh, fast speed. So at the same time uh, uh, from Caldera, uh, we are also, um, uh, trying our best to uh, address uh, this kind of uh, uh, future that's that's happening right now. Fantastic, thank you. And Poonam, what's your perspective on this? Could you tell us a little bit about the cutting edge innovation that is happening? Um, in your state, you talk about uh, using uh, data and tech a lot to manage response to COVID um, just now. So we are using a hybrid cloud model. So if we have private as well as public cloud, we're also, I think the future, where is the evidence of future in the now? I feel we are going to be moving even our mainframe systems, because as you know, we have a lot of legacy systems. We're moving them onto the cloud as well. So we're using mainframe as a service. That's another cloud provider. And we're going to move our entire systems onto the cloud. And then later on, maybe transform the code but right now main mainframe is here to stay. Um, I think also the future is going to be a lot of mobile mobile apps. So basically right now the applications that we have on the cloud already do have APIs for 
each data set, each field in the data set, they're all connectable with APIs. So developers can build really great applications on the data. But in the future, I think we're gonna have more and more mobile apps where they are compliant with uh, cell phones and people, because as you know, now everyone likes to have everything on their phone, right? So we're going um, a lot towards that as well. Fantastic, thank you. And let's look at the fourth bit of our discussion now. What is worth keeping from the present? What do we have at the moment that's working really well and we don't want to lose as we build new models for the future? And Thomas, if I could go to you first, you talked about future where there is a greater sharing of data between social and healthcare services, team-based um, care and more preventive um, services as well. What do we already have at the moment that's working really well that can serve us? Uh, well, to be Yes, uh, thanks, thanks, Meta. Actually, I, I think I think today healthcare all over the world, including Singapore, uh, benefits from what is still a trusted relationship between mm -hmm. uh, doctors, nurses, therapists, and the patient, right, and caregivers, and there is this uh, community that uh, revolves around the patient. There is a sense that the patients. The person's uh, needs and wants are still uh, his or her uh, uh, autonomy, right? Uh, and I think uh, when you think about that transition to this very uh, digitally driven, very uh, uh, cloud driven future, it, it can be in some ways dehumanizing. It can be in some ways a, a kind of a translocation of what are familiar and sound physical contact right and this is something that we need to be able to replicate or if anything else create a new hybridization of what does it mean to augment that physical that warm that that trusting relationship with something that is quite uh, invisible right and yet enabling a uh, classic example is a chat bot for example if we introduce chat bots into health uh, questionnaires, for example, right? Um, do we expect the individual to to see this uh, response as a machine, or would they be still thinking about the human? And and there there's a lot of human factor design that is involved in making sure that we actually do not create an environment where people become cynical, right, of the technology that we're introducing. And I think that is where the greatest risk uh, resides as we move. Uh, into the future, yeah, which we must preserve, yes. Great, thank you. And uh, Jingyi, if I could bring you in here to talk about um, what do you feel is working really well at the moment um, at the work that you're doing at HCS? Uh, okay, I, I think it's it's a very, very, very short line on this. And I just really feel that it's really an attitude, which is like everyone having that continuous thirst for data. Um, I think really with that, um, that's when, um, you know, as long as you really want data to be in, um, everybody's direction is pretty much aligned and they will be able to chart, like, you know, have, building the right infrastructure for it, um, bring the right people for it. So it's really an attitude. So I just, I just see that as long as everyone have that continuous thirst for data, that's, um, that's definitely something that it's worth keeping from the present, yeah. And then it helps us all to chat towards the future, yeah. Conan, what about you? Um, I think the biggest thing that we should always keep, which we are using right now is documentation. Uh, I know I'm totally switching topics now, but because documentation is something we will always need, right? Whether we move every data set we have to the cloud or whatever we do, whatever the future holds, if we don't have the documentation, then as we lose staff or, you know, staff retires, we won't have a backup plan on, you know, how did we do it? What did we do? What worked? What didn't? Lessons learned, documents. To me, documentation is key. Another thing that really work, is worth keeping from how we're doing things now is having a really good team. So by having a good, strong team, I don't just mean data scientists, data analysts. I also mean people who are from outside the field so that we have someone that can also think outside the box. Because sometimes I feel since we are so looking at it one way, everyone's looking at it as a data scientist. 
we don't think about the general public and how they might view the same data that we're presenting. So for example, one use case was we were working for a financial, the comptroller's office, and they had asked us to uh, set up a site for them. And we all sat together and said, oh, wow, this site is perfect. We put all the math together, formulas behind the scenes and everything. And when we gave it to them, they're like, we cannot work with this. This is too complicated. And that made us step outside and think, okay, yeah, as data scientists, we know what we're doing. But for people that are not as technical as us, they needed to be more user friendly, et cetera. So we just redesigned everything so that it was easier for them to understand. So I feel documentation, thinking outside the box should always stay even in the future. And Andy, uh, what are you uh, thinking on this? What are some of the building blocks do you think that we already have in place to build a future for perhaps an AI powered and data driven government? So I think as a technology provider, um, uh, we we constantly keep in mind that uh, uh, the, uh, if we just produce another tool, another product, another uh, gadget, um, that's going to add to a whole lot of tools that our customer has to deal with. Uh, so the decision of the company is to continue uh, on the path of being uh, an open source company. Um, that that we see uh, is a lot of us coming from uh, customer. Uh, being open source, uh, that means uh, the, the skill set is already in the market uh, and the adoption is um, can be very fast uh, because it's uh, open source. Um, so based on that, uh, we design our product and technology uh, to continue on this open source path. Uh, so for, for example, our Caldera machine learning platform uh, adopt um, the open source approach to allow uh, users, uh, business users and data scientists to be able to uh, run their code based on the open source knowledge that they have. Um, that doesn't require um, you know, a large amount of training uh, because the, the users of our system is already familiar with the open source uh, um, skill set. So we'll continue on this path. Fantastic, thank you, Andy. And Vincent, what's your perspective on this? We've heard quite a few different uh, I think voices at the moment on that. Yeah, I, I think the challenge is that I'm the last one. So probably I will repeat quite a lot of what everybody has said, very insightful thing. But I just want to repeat two things. One is that the, the fundamental needs to be there. And I hope we continue to focus on data governance and the fundamental of um, data taxonomy uh, uh, in terms of making sure that data is secured and also at the same time, there is uh, ethics when it talks about data. That's very important because those are the fundamental that will help us uh, in future as well. And we need to constantly ask ourselves how to maintain those things. That's one. And, and, and secondly, it's more pertinent to Singapore. I think that Singapore government has done a wonderful job in terms of investing in data scientists and making sure that as many people as possible uh, get into the data space. We need to continuously do that. In fact, we should, should even strengthen it because I think that the future is data and everybody needs to know how to use data because that is going to be our window of opportunity where we will lead from other people and we continue need to invest in the people part of it. Over, thank you. Fantastic, thanks. And now just looking at the last bit of the conversation where we want to tie it all together and how we can bridge uh, the gap between these two paradigms. We, we, we've talked about where we want to be in the future and we've got a good understanding of where we are um, right now, and there have been some sort of common themes that have emerged throughout the conversation, issues that we need to address. And Vincent, one of them you talked about just now is about data governance and getting those fundamentals right. What do we need to do to do that? So you're asking me now? Or, or... Yes. <laughs> okay, um, look, I, I look at it as that um, I, I've been in private sector most of my life until recently in the government. And I strongly believe tone at the top is extremely important, which means that in order for the whole organization to move, uh, the leaders at the top not only must speak it, but they must do it and practice it. And this is extremely important if the organization is going to change the fiber of the whole organization. That's one. And, 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 and uh, this is not to be underrated because uh, if you look at successful organizations, they all have the DNA of the leaders. And, 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 and so this is extremely important. 
the other thing that we can bridge is that we must continuously drown down in terms of uh, continuous learning and, and also having the, um, the ability to always ask ourselves, how can we do better? And what is it that we do not? And, and go and uh, a thirst for new information. And that will put us in good state at any time in life. And I think that that's extremely important. Over. And Thomas, uh, what actions and steps should we be taking uh, to get to the kind of future and healthcare that you talked about where it's team-based, we maintain that trust and uh, where we're able to um, lower the cost of healthcare as well? Yes, so, so I, I think uh, what, what NHG is doing right now is that, uh, as, as Vincent says, we, we are making sure that we are true to our uh, core values, right, of, of, for the patient, enhancing the, I think, life, years of life to the patient. Uh, we, we think that business needs to always lead at the front and then technology needs to then enable, right, the business outcomes and goals. So for healthcare, the business is moving from healthcare to health, from treatment to prevention and uh, creating that value I think what we are doing now is to create digital solutions uh, that bridge the physical uh, digital uh, divide, right? There are many uh, elements in our physical journey of our patients today that are pain points. Right? And how can we then use data-driven solutions to bridge that, those pain points? to ensure that from one end to the other, we, we are enable them right, to live better, easier, with more convenience, with more assurances. And as you've mentioned, with the assurance that this is not coming at an exorbitant cost to the system. And so I think the selection of use cases uh, that are relevant, whether it's AI-driven health, uh, decision-making, diagnostics, whether it is... Uh, the transactions, right, to enable transactions to be easier, whether it is to bring a healthcare provide, sorry, a caregiver into the same digital space as a digitally uh, naive patient, right? I think these are the things that we need to do with empathy, with a lot of uh, uh, sense that we are doing this for the right reason. And that's how we will bridge the paradigms. Mm -hmm. How do we bridge that uh, gap between health and social uh, that you talked about? Do we need new ways of managing um, health and social data to do that? Yes. So I, I think firstly, we need to agree on what is that data sharing uh, uh, ecosystem between uh, social data and health data. Secondly, we need to establish a, a platforms, right? Business to business platforms in which providers can share information uh, in the secure environment, and as uh, uh, as was mentioned, uh, the ability to to provide that segregation and partitioning of data, so that we are still uh, fairly safe within where we where that data is residing at rest. Uh, I think uh, Andy mentioned that, and and I think the the last point is that health health providers actually need to recognize actually that the social services sometimes are doing more for the well-being of our patients than what a simple 20 minute 10 minute consultation can do and that's where i think a lot of humility is needed in that next paradigm fantastic thank you and uh, Purnam, what's your perspective on some of the steps you want the state and your team to be taking to get to that future you uh, painted a vision of so I feel uh, the more data we can bring together and present to the public, the more successful we will be. And so again, what we've done is to be successful is we did research on all these different states in America and we said, okay, what's working? Because right now, as you know, you can Google any state and you can see what data they're putting out there. You can see which ones are the most popular, which ones are getting the most embeds. So we basically made a document of every single state and what they're doing, for example, with data, with transportation, with health, with different uh, agencies. And we keep that and when we meet our own New Jersey state agencies, then we present it to them and say, see, this is what's working in New York. This is what's working in Idaho, you know, and that really helps them say, wow, we do have this data. 
we had it all along. We just didn't know how useful it is or it could be to the public. So to me, I feel data is really good in the sense if you know how to use it. So by itself, data is kind of boring. But if you take data and you put analytics on top of it, it's like the frosting on the data. And it makes it so much more inter interesting and interactive for the public. So if you take that same spreadsheet and make a few pie charts, bar charts, line graphs on it, everyone's interested. Everyone wants to see it. They also start to understand it versus just giving them a spreadsheet where it's kind of boring for them. So mm -hmm. I feel that is a very good strategy, which we have now, and we're going to use it, keep continuing to use it so that we can improve on our services for the public. Mm -hmm. And what about... Um civil servants' ability to work with data and understand data. Are we seeing a future where um, every public servant needs to have that, data, uh, uh, that, that basic um, sort of, um, ability to understand uh, data? Absolutely. And again, as CDO, I feel that is part of my role to make sure that everyone does understand data. And if not, then we need to understand where we are failing and we need to improve on our own services so that everyone understands the data. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, Jeannie, just coming to you for this, um, what kind of steps uh, is uh, HTX taking as a fantastic new unit um, leading innovation in the home team agency? Are you looking at uh, new ways of working, uh, new, new models of uh, working with technology? Are you looking at new uh, proof of concept um, and ways in which you're using data? Sure. Uh, after all, data is an uh, valuable asset to all organizations, whether it is a new or an old organization in Singapore. So actually, at the, at the primary basis here is that um, I, I think our mandate here is very clear. We want to serve our citizens better. Um, so actually, I think what's really important is that we should ensure that while we are charting towards, uh, while we are progressing technologically, we have to ensure that we leave no public servants behind uh, in this progression. So I think ensuring everyone is trained to keep up with all this technological progression is very much important. At the same time, I do agree with uh, what Vincent actually said that um, leaders play a quintessential role. So leaders need really to have a clear vision to bring the path forward, um, like inculcating you know, the center of uh, culture of excellence of how you know, the organization intend to use or even de deliver data to serve public good. So I think that's one very um, important point. Um, I, I, and, and, and with that, um, I think uh, others like public servants on the ground will be able to have a very clear direction or, or vision to head towards. So that is where we are heading towards as well. Yeah. And you are part of one of those centers of excellence at HTX. How, how are you uh, helping to create that vision for the future and bringing all the other agencies along for that? Yeah, so so we have uh uh as well as like other home team departments who have, who actually engage us to do uh various projects. So I I think from that perspective, we are trying to start small. So uh, we, we need to start somewhere. So we of course we will start small. Um, you know uh uh, uh with our technological skill sets out there. Uh uh, helping them with all those projects. And then uh, from an agency level, slowly we will actually scale up to an enterprise-wide le level across all home team departments. So that is an area that we are looking at. Of course, for, with any other projects that we are looking at, we always start off with things like the proof of concept. And then you know, once the proof of concept is working, then that's when we, we try to uh, roll out the projects uh, full-fledged. So when we talk about how we intend to bridge these paradigms. I guess I, I think it's going to be, it's not, it's going to be an arduous process. It's not going to be an easy one. So um, there will be certain practices that is that is ingrained in certain units for, for, for quite some time. So the challenge is to actually, you know, break the current existing uh, work model and then uh, bring them forward. So probably it's 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 starting by showcasing things like, you know, with all these like um, new techniques and all these things, how uh, it can help improve uh, the efficiency of the processes currently. So, so things like that. I, I think it's a, it's a process for them to actually understand how technology can help them way forward. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jean. And just finally going to you, Andy, 
uh, okay. how can uh, technology providers work better with government? How can that partnership be made stronger to help bridge uh, this gap? So I think uh, a lot of planning uh, is uh, needed. Uh, you know, as we already spoken that uh, data is going to explode uh, at a very high rate, uh, the velocity, the, the volume and the variety. Um, so to, to plan properly uh, is to, is to um, really to do, do the job of uh, uh, stewardship, um, uh, getting the right infrastructure, getting the right design architecture to be able to deal with this large explosion uh, in the coming future. Um, so that is to avoid uh, rework or um, double work when, when you have, when you have a infrastructure that's only designed to deal with a terabyte of data and um, in a very short time you need to deal with petabytes of data or even beyond. Um, is this infrastructure that you have today um, gives you the ability to uh, uh, stretch uh, to be to, to get more elastic compute out of it or get more elastic storage out of it. Um, so this planning part, uh, I think um, uh, the engagement uh, with government agency, uh, this is where we would like to uh, invite uh, and, and also like to share with uh, government agency uh, on workshops or discussion uh, with the business user and the uh, technical um, uh, architects uh, how we can design something uh, for the future uh, that is future proof. Uh, I think that's that's important. Whether it is on prem, private cloud, or public cloud, how can how can this look like uh, in the future? I think that's that's one thing. Um, the other thing is training. Uh, we talk about skills. We talk about uh, the ability to to get uh, people uh, to be ready to to use this tool. Um, I think the enablement courses. Uh, where we come in, we, we have lots and lots of courses to be able to engage users to up their skill, whether it's a data administrator, data engineers, or data scientists, uh, to enable uh, people to make use of the data after uh, you know getting on this skill. Uh, and, it, and it's a constant training, right? Um, um, technology was always in, evolved. So, so the training uh, component is, is always a uh, uh, a uh, regular constant thing uh, that we see. Uh, and of course, uh, the last point that we see will be uh, to connect and learn. Um, we have global uh, pool of uh, reference customer uh, that we are uh, happy to connect uh, people um, to share their case, to learn from each other. Hey, uh, you know, even for us as a technology provider, we are learning from our customer. Um, not just technology alone, but uh, the, the governance and the policies, how do we design our product to be able to um, uh, respond uh, or, or work within the policy or the governance uh, required uh, by government users. So these are some of the points uh, that I see how we can engage. Thank you, Andy. That's all we have time for today. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this fascinating conversation. And if you have any questions or would like to know more, uh, please feel free to get in touch with the GovInsider team or with Andy at Cloudera. His email and number are there. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you so much. <laughs>